Orwa had an uncommon, almost mystical commitment to humanism, to the interests and protections of the common person. God was dead, faith was on the decline, and in the vacuum, new sources of spiritual meaning and purpose vied for influence and a monopoly on truth, or as Orwell described them, the smelly little orthodoxies which are now contending for our souls. But this doesn't quite capture all of it. You can lead your life obsessing about human nature and the human condition and not leave a legacy like Orwell's. The fact is, he was a man of uncommon integrity. This will sound nauseatingly cliché to some of you. He is, to borrow the words of Christopher Hitchens, an object of sickly veneration and sentimental overpraise, employed to stultify schoolchildren with his insufferable rightness and purity. And I hope this series doesn't leave you thinking that Orwell is beyond criticism, but there's no dancing around this one. He was a relentless, sometimes arguably a priggish moralist. Fortunately, he was guided by sound moral principles, defending human freedoms, self-determination, justice, equality. To the moral skeptics frowning right now, I will add that his political assessments on imperialism and totalitarianism have largely been vindicated by history, and will continue to be so, particularly his many lessons on human nature and the accessible ways in which he communicated these will likely continue making his work important as history unfolds. But of course, it takes more than principles to live and act morally. Orwell possessed an integrity which I would argue was made up of two basic virtues. One, philosophical honesty and consistency, and two, the fact he practiced what he preached. Beginning with the first then, perhaps it's best to use Orwell's own words to describe what he admired in one of his literary heroes, a great social critic much like himself. Writing in 1940 to the Charles Dickens scholar Humphrey House, Orwell argued that because Dickens's moral sense was sound, he would have been able to find his bearing in any political or economic milieu. The thing that frightens me about the modern intelligentsia is their inability to see that human society must be based on common decency, whatever the politics and economic forms may be. The most salient example of this failure of the intelligentsia during Orwell's lifetime, as we've already seen, was a half-blind, uncritical attitude among Britain's party socialists and leftist intellectuals toward the horrors of the Soviet Union. This was one of the great blind spots of the time. The USSR was seen as a sort of political and ideological homeland. Stalin's political purges, the show trials, the false confessions, the mass surveillance, the famine, terror and paranoia of his reign, these were overlooked, swept under the rug by a supposedly progressivist uh, intelligentsia. Many either looked the other way, or even justify the horrors as a regrettable means to an end, that the millions murdered and starved to death were inevitable casualties in the struggle to build a socialist utopia in a backward country. In a particularly lucid essay called Notes on Nationalism, Orwell emphasises the widespread self-delusion among communists, but also among all ideologues more generally. They, quote, have the power of not seeing resemblances between similar sets of facts. Left-wing intellectuals, therefore, were quick to condemn Hitler's and Mussolini's fascism, but failed to grasp its fundamental likeness to Stalinist communism. He writes, quote, Actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits, but according to who does them. Stalin purged, terrorised, and starved his countrymen, whom he considered enemies of the state, and this was justifiable. Hitler purged, terrorised, and starved countrymen, whom he considered enemies of the state, and this was widely condemned. Any sort of moral outrage can be excused when, quote, it is committed by our side, he writes. Equally, the British Tory, for instance, will, quote, defend self-determination in Europe and oppose it in India with no feeling of inconsistency. What Orwell is referring to is now well known as cognitive dissonance, the act of holding two contradictory beliefs. One thought is comfortable to the mind, 
and makes a person believe they are right. The other is uncomfortable, as it logically contradicts the first one. And so, to feel comfortable once again, that nagging second contradictory thought is suppressed. Or, well, famously satirised, this cognitive bias. Those familiar with 1984 will recognise it as doublethink. Quote, To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness, while telling carefully constructed lies. To hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out, knowing them to be contradictory, and believing in both of them. In the novel, the uncomfortable, undesirable thoughts that outer party members might experience are in fact rational, logical, moral. They are thoughts like 2 plus 2 equals 4, or slavery is bad and love is good. But the inner party encourages their suppression. Why? Because the party, in its bid for absolute power, wants to control objective truth. They want to dictate what is rational, logical, moral, even if it isn't. Because if they can do that, they can tell any number of lies to stay in power, and their brainwashed subjects will lap them up. That is how they stay in power. The party can say that 2 plus 2 isn't in fact 4, but 5. This then allows them to mandate, as the party slogan goes, that war is peace, that freedom is slavery, that ignorance is strength. And this cognitive distortion has been so internalised, thanks to the systematic brainwashing in the world of 1984, that the process is in fact a form of self-censorship. It is self-inflicted, self-thought policed. The very minds of the subjects act as agents to the party, suppressing seditious thoughts that might contradict the party line. All else satire is clear. Totalitarian regimes thrive and remain in power as long as there is no critical thought. This is why tyrants have historically persecuted intellectuals. If the Soviet regime can suppress thought, they can manipulate objective truth for their own ends. They can falsify and reinvent history. They can depict a dark, tragic past under the yoke of evil oppressors. They can depict a struggling present, the struggle to unshackle society from the mental and social bonds of a bourgeois imperialist past, and they can depict a utopian future, which only they can bring about. Quote, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. They can murder critics of the regime and falsely brand these as traitors to the revolution, erasing any record of them. Amid the climate of terror and paranoia among the masses, common people become agents of the state as they denounce their neighbours, their friends, their own families. Critical thought dies when tyrants win against democracy. Those who voice it are banished or murdered. Those who can think it are silenced through fear. Those who don't become puppets of the regime. The British intelligentsia and leftist party members, of course, though not living under dictatorship, were playing right into the hands of the totalitarians, with their ends justify the means rhetoric, their romantic adulation of Stalin and the Soviet Union. They were abetting and perpetuating this murderous, lying, dehumanising regime from afar. And by failing to stand up to tyranny, they were laying the groundwork for potential totalitarianism in their own country, since the message they were telegraphing by their inaction was that as long as a regime aligned with their basic ideology, it would go unopposed, no matter how undemocratic and cruel. And when they finally woke up, it would be too late. After Orwell's dramatic departure from Spain and return to Britain, he realised the quasi-absence of British press coverage on the liquidation of the Republican revolutionary factions by the Spanish Communist government. And, of course, at the very heart of it, the infiltration of the Communist Party by Stalin's Russia. It made him realise the scale of the socialist hypocrisy and the dangers that their short-sightedness and their admiration for Stalin pose for democracy. In the unpublished preface of Animal Farm, in fact, the ironically banned preface, 
Orwell wrote, quote, Unpopular ideas can be silenced and inconvenient facts kept dark without the need for any official ban. In Newspeak, this could well be called group hush, a sort of don't rock the boat or defy Uncle Joe atmosphere. There was a strange, unwritten orthodoxy among socialists in which any condemnation of Stalin and the Soviet experiment would be treasonous to the movement. And so intellectuals, media tycoons, printers, radio broadcasters all towed the line in self-censorship and the suppression of inconvenient truths about the regime. The big test for Stalinist sympathisers came in August 1939 with the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact when Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union entered into an alliance. All of a sudden, after years of denouncing fascism, pro-Soviet communists were now told by Stalin's yesmen to toe the Nazi line and dissuade British intervention in the war. To remain blindly loyal to the Soviet Union now meant becoming a spokesperson for Hitler, much to Orwell's amusement. The alliance, though, was short-lived. Hitler invaded Russia in June 1941 and broke the pact. Leftist party members and the intelligentsia could return to bashing Nazism with greater comfort, once again dissociating the Soviet Union from fascist tyranny, broadcasting lies and suppressing the inconvenient truths. All this with feverish wartime urgency and revived conviction in the communist cause and the noble struggle of the Red Army. Also, Britain's new alliance with the Soviet Union in the fight against fascism made this group hush even stronger. The unwillingness to condemn Stalin was now compounded by an unwillingness to appear unpatriotic or to hamper the British war effort. It largely accounts for why Animal Farm was rejected by at least four different publishers, a fable whose simplicity and accessibility made the scathing attack on the Soviet Union all the more discomforting for socialists. Though completed in February 1944, it was published as late as August 1945, after the end of the war in Europe. Critical thought, said Orwell, is a necessity. In the same essay, he concludes that it is not simply an intellectual effort that is needed to be consistent in your judgments. The intellect cannot be trusted alone. The biases and emotional barriers are simply too strong. They will obscure and suppress those inconvenient facts that clash with your core beliefs, that clash with your conviction that the cause you believe in is entirely benevolent, and that history will absolve the cause of its sins. It needs something else besides the intellect, says Orwell. Quote, You cannot get rid of those feelings simply by taking thought, but you can at least recognise that you have them and prevent them from contaminating your mental processes. The emotional urges which are inescapable and are perhaps even necessary to political action should be able to exist side by side with an acceptance of reality. But this, I repeat, needs a moral effort. A moral effort. Again, it's not that rational thinking people cannot reflect on these inconvenient facts. They can, especially if they're aware that these cognitive barriers do exist. But it is a moral task, a moral duty, if they truly wish to uphold socialist principles like equality and fraternity, freedom from oppression, to risk the consequences of speaking out when these are under attack by leaders who claim to defend them. Much to his credit, Orwell never had a Stalinist phase, as was so common at the time. But then he himself was liable to many similar biases. On many occasions he confessed so himself, and you see them all throughout his work. He is consistently honest with himself. Hitchens put it very well. Orwell is, quote, constantly taking his temperature. And he is fully transparent with the reader, telling them what his honest thoughts are, no matter how simplistic, exaggerated, contradictory or outrageous they might sound on the surface. His 1940 review of Hitler's Mein Kampf is shockingly candid. Quote, I have reflected that Ever since Hitler came to power, I would certainly kill him if I could get within reach of him, but that I could feel no personal animosity towards him. I will now quote the next passage in full, as it is as useful now as a 
historic document as it was for people at the time of writing. It is an attempt by Orwell to understand the emotional appeal of Hitler, the charisma that brainwashed millions of people into committing and abetting some of the most horrific atrocities in human history. The fact is that there is something deeply appealing about him. One feels it again when one sees his photographs, and I recommend especially the photograph at the beginning of Hearst and Blackett's edition, which shows Hitler in his early brown shirt days. It is a pathetic, dog-like face, the face of a man suffering under intolerable wrongs. In a rather more manly way, it reproduces the expression of innumerable pictures of Christ crucified, and there is little doubt that that is how Hitler sees himself. The initial personal cause of his grievance against the universe can only be guessed at, but at any rate the grievance is here. He is the martyr, the victim, Prometheus chained to the rock, the self-sacrificing hero who fights single-handed against impossible odds. If he were killing a mouse, he would know how to make it seem like a dragon. One feels, as with Napoleon, that he is fighting against destiny, that he can't win, and yet that he somehow deserves to. Can't wait for this video to get demonetized. Elsewhere in his writings, Orwell frequently anticipates the reader's reaction. To give just one example, in The Road to Wigan Pier, referring to his experience after leaving Burma, quote, I was conscious of an immense weight of guilt that I'd got to expiate. I suppose that sounds exaggerated, but if you do for five years a job that you thoroughly disapprove of, you'll probably feel the same. He'll often also tell the reader that he had been hugely wrong about something in the past, but now knew better. We'll, we'll see this again later. Specifically returning to his biases though, more than errors of judgement or his shocking confessions, I'll provide some examples. Earlier, we saw his shocking attitude towards the Burmese priests, that on the one hand he wished to end their subjugation, but on the other wished to violently murder them in anger for mocking him and making his job a nuisance. Here, a bruised ego, frustration and common racism combine vilely to create homicidal urges in him even if a strong moral compass directs him to recognise very lucidly that their subjugation by the British made their defiance and impertinence completely justifiable. And he actually tells the reader that he has these thoughts, despite how damning they might appear. His racism crops up in another essay, on his time in Marrakesh before the outbreak of World War II. Orwell was fond of animals, and he was incensed to see Quote, within five minutes on Moroccan soil, that the gentle, obedient Moroccan donkeys were cruelly overloaded with wares. At the same time, he writes, it had taken him several weeks to process the file of elderly Moroccan ladies carrying firewood past his home. Quote, Poor old earth-coloured bodies, bodies reduced to bones and leathery skin, bent double under the crushing weight. Quote, Though they had registered themselves on my eyeballs, I cannot truly say that I had seen them. Firewood was passing, that was how I saw it. It was only that one day I happened to be walking behind them, and the curious up and down motion of a load of wood drew my attention to the human being underneath it. Referring to the donkey, quote, This kind of thing makes one's blood boil, whereas, on the whole, the plight of the human beings does not. I am not commenting merely pointing to a fact. People with brown skins are next door to invisible. Anyone can be sorry for the donkey with its galled back, but it is generally owing to some kind of accident if one even notices the old woman under her load of sticks. Much of the writing from this essay has of course aged poorly. Before judging, I would urge you to consider that he is writing from the perspective of an Englishman in 1939, when standard racial sensitivities were obviously not as high. What is clear, though, is that this is a man grappling with his prejudices. He recognises that the fact he did not pay attention to this poor woman first is abnormal, and that it contradicts his humanism and his usual empathy for the miseries of working-class people. The Road to Wigan Pier is another clear example of Orwellian honesty. In the second part of the book, a key idea he emphasises was that class differences were real no matter how much the intellectual socialist denied or fought against them, and that, in his age at least, they were inevitable. 
and he could say this from experience, given the many months he had spent in close proximity with working-class people in the north of England, or from doing menial work in Paris. Quote, However much you like them, however interesting you find their conversation, there is always that accursed itch of class difference. This statement was practically seditious for a British socialist at the time. The entire second part of the book was in fact heavily condemned by commentators on the left and only just scraped past publication. But Orwell explains himself. He takes aim at socialists who preached the abolition of class distinctions, but whom he notices hadn't taken on working class manners or altered their tastes. They hadn't actually proletarianized themselves. They were still very much bourgeois. Quote, we all rail against class distinctions, but very few people seriously want to abolish them. He considers that the reason for this was that there were real widespread biases towards the working classes, and that these were nurtured in childhood when the bourgeois was, quote, taught to hate, fear, and despise the working class. He provides various myths that he himself had grown up to believe as a middle-class snob, that the working classes smelled, that they were rude, dirty, dishonest, even dangerous. These, he argues, were the same sorts of beliefs ingrained in middle-class socialists and which prevented them from dropping their middle-class attitudes, tastes, and manners. Fundamentally, they still found the working classes repellent. They did find their speech and their behaviours vulgar, their pastimes uncouth. Of course, they couldn't say this. It would be insulting and would, at least superficially, contradict their Marxist worldview. But for Orwell, these socialists, who preached the abolition of class distinctions, but then found themselves unable to proletarianize themselves, they were doing the movement of socialism an enormous disservice. Quote, You have forced the pace and set up an uneasy, unnatural equality between class and class. The resultant friction brings to the surface all kinds of feelings that might otherwise have remained buried, perhaps forever. Feelings like disdain, snobbishness, or anger from the socialist bourgeois, and feelings of defensiveness, of smallness, and hostility from the proletarian in reaction. Quote, the only sensible procedure, he concludes memorably, is to go slow and not force the pace. If you secretly think of yourself as a gentleman, and as such the superior of the greengrocer's brand boy, it is far better to say so than to tell lies about it. Ultimately, you have got to drop your snobbishness, but it is fatal to pretend to drop it before you are really ready to do so. Just as he urged socialists not to deceive themselves by glorifying Russia, he urged them not to distract themselves with mainstream, unrealistic, and petty dogma. I should add that Orwell's argumentation here, particularly the autobiographical bits, are typical. He opens himself up to attack and charges of treason by the very admission that he had once felt real disdain for the working classes, and despite actually having overcome it, for the rest of his life, and even long after his death, socialists repeatedly snubbed him for even suggesting the notion that working classes smelled. They clearly missed the point. Besides this, Orwell takes the time to explain how these prejudices came about and why the feelings he had were irrational. He cares more about building a socialist future than the very likely risk of alienating himself from the left, pointing out what was wrong with the movement, why it was failing, and how it could be restored was far more important than having the reputation of a socialist traitor. It was time to be pragmatic and actually unite, rather than tarnish the cause with frivolities. All this he does with empathy. Noticing class differences does not make you a bad socialist. Snobbishness is difficult to drop. We do have these prejudices. He could write from a middle class perspective as he was middle class and in most ways had middle-class tastes and manners, but then he could also identify with the working classes, and unlike many socialists of his time, did not do them the disservice of romanticising them. They weren't all common decency and simple virtue and moderation. They also came with apathy, hedonism, 
power worship, groupthink, and all sorts of things the great moralist railed against, and which appear in Orwell's depiction of the proles in 1984. I should add that he hardly felt middle and upper classes were blameless for these either. In certain ways, Orwell was a 20th century Socrates. The Greek philosopher famously made himself extremely unpopular by showing people who thought they were wise, they were in fact not as wise as they believed. This he did by asking questions, by poking holes in their reasoning, pointing out contradictions, gaps, inconsistencies. In Why I Write, Orwell remarked, quote, I knew that I had a facility with words and a power of facing unpleasant facts. This rather simple phrase modestly encapsulates the brilliance of Orwell, a masterful writer who could imaginatively and persuasively, through satire, journalism, literature and essay writing, convey into words his sixth sense for humbug and hypocrisy. The traits that are needed for this power of facing unpleasant facts are superior levels of critical thought, intellectual honesty to analyse and look beyond one's cognitive biases, a strong moral compass to guide one's views and beliefs and anchor them in simple moral principles, particularly in the dramatic, fast-moving period like the 1930s and 40s, and most certainly bravery the capacity to speak one's mind in the face of hostility and defensive emotions, to risk pariah status and one's own life and career. Orwell had all. Are there any biographical details which account for this, you might ask? In particular, his constant alertness to lies and general nonsense in political discourse, an uncommonly shrewd common sense. Well, first, he had been a precocious thinker, Many of his school friends recall the unorthodox, in fact seditious quality of his beliefs from an early age, which we'll explore more later. There seems to have been a contrarian streak in him, which predisposed him not to accept common societal beliefs at face value. Ironically, he chose a career in the imperial service, following in his father's footsteps and foregoing higher education. But he would spend five years, quietly rotting away with a bad conscience, before finally throwing in the towel. It's quite possible that Burma was the most significant intellectual turning point for him, a sort of Damascene awakening. Did it dawn on him that he had been indoctrinated, that he had been complicit in a foul, nationwide lie on the merits and supposed benevolence of the British Empire, and that not just his countrymen, but his own family had been in on the racket Orwell's escapades in Europe shortly after quitting the service might not just have been guilt expiation or the search for writing material, underlying them could well have been that reigning thought, what else have I been deceived on? What other lies have I been taught to believe, been inculcated by family and society, that are obvious to the naked eye if one actually bothers to look where most don't? What other things passed off as good or normal or respectable by those closest to me. Figures of trust are in fact deeply reprehensible. This sort of experience changes a person, especially given his own father was in the Bengali opium department. It's merely a theory, so tread with caution, but it might explain the sophistication and intensity of this particular hallmark of Orwell's character and intellect, the fine-tuned bullshit antenna, if you will. And the fact that in Burma he had been forced to muzzle his anti-imperialism, to self-censor his true feelings due to the browbeating orthodoxy in the service, meant that when he left and was his own boss, he could speak his mind freely. He could be master of his own mind and movements, not a slavish creature of orthodoxy and tradition. It led him onto the intellectual and personal journey with which, by now, we are familiar, championing independence movements, forever exposing the cant and hypocrisies of intellectuals, socialists, bourgeois capitalists, and totalitarians. So we've now looked at this intellectual honesty and consistency, now let's move on to that second feature of Orwell's integrity, that of practicing what he preached. He didn't just say he did. He aligned his life decisions with his principles. When his police job became unbearable for him, he resigned from his post and left the service. 
This might not seem extraordinary, but for an Englishman in the 1920s, whose own father had been in the service, this was the act of an unusually strong will. I should add, by the way, that he was so desperate to quit that he sacrificed a considerable sum of sick leave money, which he was entitled to collect. Money which he didn't even have to work for, and which would normally be extremely desirable for any writer struggling to launch a career. This was the man who, in order to understand extreme poverty, its physical and psychological miseries, lived and roughed it up among tramps and beggars and other outcasts, went hot-picking in Kent, kitchen portering in Parisian hotels, and even tried to spend Christmas and New Year's behind bars in London. All this to get, quote, out of the respectable world altogether in his social rebellion, returning with mature, useful lessons and a genuine willingness to change attitudes. This was also the man who thrust a frail body into working class slum houses and fixed caravans, his tubercular lungs into the guts of the earth, so that he could understand what life was like for the neglected underbelly of British society, to document and publish its real conditions with a view to advancing socialism. This was the man who risked his life in Spain to fight fascism, quote, plain and simple, and getting shot in the throat by a sniper's bullet. He confessed that in any other age, he would have been a simple prose writer, or even a vicar, but that the age he lived in gave him no choice but to attack totalitarians and despots in all their forms, while fighting on the side of the oppressed. Given his character, it's a supremely questionable belief. When World War II broke out, Orwell was hell-bent on fighting, enlisting on the 9th of September 1939, just six days after Britain declared war. He tried every possible way to enlist, but on account of his poor health, he was rejected at every turn. Speaking about his medical exemption, he told a friend, quote, I hold what half of the men in this country would have given their balls to have, but I don't want it. In the lead-up to the Blitz, when there were real fears of a Nazi invasion, Orwell was highly active in his role as sergeant within the Home Guard. This was a British armed citizen militia, acting as the last line of defence in the event of an invasion. He saw the Volunteer Corps as the militia that could lead a socialist revolution in Britain, so he devoted himself accordingly. He wrote articles and detailed notes on training, as well as on street fighting tactics for use in lectures by the Home Guard and elsewhere. He pushed for the militia to be given immediate access to all shotguns and gunsmiths, and that hand grenades be distributed as widely as possible. A committed socialist revolutionary, he was as pragmatic as he was idealistic. During wartime Britain, he was convinced there was a revolutionary temper in the air. His lesser-known work, The Lion and the Unicorn, Socialism and the English Genius, is a call to action, expressing his optimism that patriotism and the democratic biases of the English could be binding forces for his socialist revolution, which he saw as necessary to win the war and defeat fascism. He even provided a six-point program that a revolutionary government could apply with concrete recommendations on how Britain could build a socialist, egalitarian society, and that this would also entail immediate decolonization and formal alliances with powers that had fallen to fascism, like China and Ethiopia. A shorter, related piece he wrote in the same period, reconciling his left-wing views with the need for patriotism, is perhaps one of his most radical works. It captures his sense of urgency and the extent of his revolutionary fervor. Quote, Within two years, maybe a year, if only we can hang on, we shall see changes that will surprise the idiots who have no foresight. I dare say the London gutters will have to run with blood. All right, let them, if it is necessary. But when the red militias are billeted in the Ritz, I shall still feel that the England I was taught to love so long ago, for such different reasons, is somehow persisting. The vision is haunting. As an aside, show this segment to those who mistake Orwell's words for gospel and his warnings for infallible predictions. Remembering his countless failed attempts to predict the events of World War II, a friend of Orwell said, quote, 
he was a terrible prophet. In the twilight of the war, Orwell became a war correspondent for the Observer. Despite dreadful health and the premature death of his wife, Eileen, he reported on liberated France and the final days of Nazi Germany. Much like Winston Churchill, his sights were already set on another great enemy. Animal Farm and 1984 were his great contributions in the new Cold War dividing the world into two camps. Much of Orwell's writing criticised his countrymen not only for holding contradictory beliefs, but for their short-sightedness and inaction. In 1941, he took aim at his childhood hero, H.G. Wells, for his apparent flippancy regarding the threat of Hitler, saying earlier that same year that the Nazi war machine was nearly spent and that the war was, quote, coming home to roost. Orwell criticised Wells for his naivety and believed, perhaps overly speculatively, that it stemmed from Wells's outdated Victorian worldview, in which a social order like Britain's, where science and technology reigned supreme, would always vanquish the pseudoscience and superstitions of tyrants like Hitler. But, not realising that Hitler had in fact been able to hijack advanced science and technology with monstrous efficacy to promote absolute evil. Some of Orwell's best writing is in this essay. Quote, Wells was, and still is, quite incapable of understanding that nationalism, religious bigotry, and feudal loyalty are far more powerful forces than what he himself would describe as sanity. Creatures out of the Dark Ages have come marching into the present, and if they are ghosts, they are at any rate ghosts which need a strong magic to lay them. Quote, Hitler is all the warlords and witch doctors in history rolled into one. Wells wasn't the only figure not to take Hitler seriously. Throughout the 1930s, it wasn't unusual across the intelligentsia to believe that Hitler was all bark and no bite. Quote, Only in the English-speaking countries was it fashionable to believe, right up to the outbreak of war, that Hitler was an unimportant lunatic and the German tanks made of cardboard. Orwell frequently bashed pacifists. By choosing not to fight, they were, in effect, abetting fascism. This was another inconvenient truth he prodded intellectuals to grasp. Quote, People sleep peaceably in their beds at night only because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. He also frequently derided the intelligentsia for a lack of patriotism, even anglophobia, which made them unwilling to fight for their country. Though they did not want a German or Japanese victory, as he wrote, they still found delight in seeing Singapore fall or the English being kicked out of Greece as a sort of retribution for imperialism. They might snigger and quip about traditional beliefs like faith in God or the monarchy, but then, as he argued, they had substituted Stalin for their king Marx for God, and the hammer and sickle for the Union Jack. Part of the reason for their romanticization of Stalin and flippancy about Hitler, he argued, was because the English middle classes and the intelligentsia were too sheltered. They could condemn Nazi Germany, but could not truly understand life under a totalitarian state. The suffocation and the fear it entailed were too remote too alien for them to comprehend. Quote, so much of left-wing thought is a kind of playing with fire by people who don't even know that fire is hot. The long peace within its shores, the gentleness, the slow, mild pace of English life had cradled its people into a deep slumber. As he wrote, his fellow countrymen were, quote, all sleeping the deep, deep sleep of England, from which I sometimes fear and we shall never wake until we are jerked out of it by the roar of bombs. This he wrote as early as 1937. Fortunately, he was awake. So far we focused on Orwell, the political writer, but perhaps one of the greatest testaments to his moral fibre and humanitarianism was that he set about becoming a writer not as a political advocate, but because of the love of literature that he had acquired in childhood. 
He of course had a strong social conscience before his socialist turning point in 1936, and defended ideas which were clearly left-leaning, but he was hardly the political animal that he would later become. Quote, From a very early age, perhaps the age of five or six, I knew that when I grew up, I should be a writer. Early signs of this, by his own account, were the habit of making imaginary friends, a reflection of a precocious form of creativity, but also, as he wrote, of his loneliness as a child. Friends and siblings would call this Orwell's predilection for self-pity, and it's true we should always keep this in mind, even he warns us to keep it in mind. Either way, he did develop great literary flair, writing poems and rhyming plays, also nurtured by his studies. Schoolmate and writer Cyril Connolly remembered that he and Orwell, or Eric Blair at the time, would write poetry, and then read and critique each other's work. Blair, always polite and constructive, once gave him a particularly stellar review. Connolly wrote home, proudly reporting to his mother, that he had been praised by the, quote, best poet in the school. Early on, Orwell developed a writer's habit, one which he claimed stayed with him until he was 25, of ascribing words to his visions and experiences, like a narrator's voice in his mind. Quote, I seem to be making this descriptive effort almost against my will, under a kind of compulsion from outside. In another famous essay, he remembers the sense of escapism, reading the works of favourite childhood authors while at the preparatory school of St. Cyprian's in East Sussex, quote, the joy of waking early on a summer morning and getting in an hour's undisturbed reading in the sunlit sleeping dormitory. It was during this period, in fact, that his literary foundations were built, as he immersed himself into the worlds of his childhood heroes, H.G. Wells, Ian Hay, William Makepeace Thackeray, Rudyard Kipling, and more. These were the sorts of literary giants Orwell grew up wishing to emulate in his early adolescence. The mechanical pace of learning at the preparatory school, recalled by Orwell as cruel, snobbish, and exploitative, might have done more harm than good to his passion for literature. It wasn't until he went to Eton that he enjoyed greater intellectual and extracurricular freedom, finding more time to read and pursue his own interests. He'd read almost the entire works of Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, and John Galsworthy, among other authors he considered, quote, dangerously advanced for the time, and which also surprised his schoolmasters. Like his Etonian peers, his views were increasingly anti-establishment, rejecting or expressing cynicism at monarchy, religion, Victorian England and the class system, the officer training corps, etc. In that same spirit of moody adolescence, what appealed to him in literature was the romantic fatalism in the poetry of A.E. Houseman, Percy Shelley, and Ernest Dowson, that, quote, exquisite self-pity, the nobody-loves-me feeling, particularly in Houseman. It's no surprise that it appealed to him at the time. School friends and acquaintances remember his gloominess, a strong sense of personal tragedy as a teenager. This, even if contested by others who remembered his joyfulness, even being spoiled, seems to have extended into adulthood. Such, such were the joys. Orwell's semi-autobiographical essay on St. Cyprian's is the epitome of this trend, and much of its contents are questionable. But some have wondered whether deep feelings of guilt instilled by the school, perhaps mixed with feelings of abandonment as a result of paternal absence, stayed with him. Tragedy and hopelessness ooze from his writing, particularly his 1930s novels with their lonely, unremarkable, misunderstood characters, all bound to failure. Anthony Pohl, fellow writer and friend, remembered rather cruelly, quote, how poor old George would have loved to be a poet killed in action. He did, in fact, love poetry. Those who knew him well believed this was to him the highest art form, and that he would have most wanted to be a poet had he felt he had the talent for it. Poetry does appear to have been intimately tied to his early literary sensibility. He wrote that when he was 16, Milton's Paradise Lost made him discover the, quote, joy of mere words, their, quote, sounds and associations sending, quote, shivers down my backbone. In fact, some of his most explicitly emotional writing evokes memories like this, linked to poetry. 
Writing about some of A. Houseman's verses in his 1940 essay Inside the Whale, he writes, quote, It just tinkles. Such raw, almost conversational passion is rare in Orwell's writing, usually more matter-of-factual. Quote, Between the ages of about 17 and 24, I tried to abandon this idea of becoming a writer, but I did so with the consciousness that I was outraging my true nature, and that sooner or later, I should have to settle down and write books. Outraging is a strong word. He must have meant it. Not many details are known about his thoughts and feelings during the five years he was in Burma, or at least their chronology. Fellow servicemen recall only the occasional appearance at the local club in Mandalay, but otherwise he avoided it. Any average conversation at the gentleman's club in Burmese days captures in exaggerated form the sort of absurd racial bigotry spewed there. He instead spent much of his leisure time in his lodgings, reading. We get the sense he felt he was missing out on the literati circles in Britain. Besides his natural discretion and shyness, he had little in common with his peers and colleagues in Burma. On various occasions, he wrote how even the most mediocre, unschooled oaf could live like a pampered aristocrat out there. The accounts suggest he deliberately took his distance. He kept his finger on the pulse of London's literary scene and was quite the critic in self-isolation. At least once, we're told he was so frustrated with one of the debates in a highbrow magazine he followed that he stormed out of his bungalow, rested the magazine against a tree, and used it for target practice. Frustration and decay of meaningful purpose seem to have run parallel with self-disgust, self-censorship, and profound guilt over his role within the empire. He had to endure an extreme version of an establishment-run system, and for a long time, before rejecting it outright and deciding that financial instability, reputational damage, and the potential disowning from his family were all prices he was willing to pay if it assured him intellectual freedom and the possibility to do what he truly loved. It's difficult to imagine somebody less suited for the role of imperial policeman than George Orwell, but he learned his lesson the hard way. Blindly following tradition and comfort was not for him, even if he did remain curiously traditional in many other ways. When he returned to Europe in 1927, he started writing almost immediately, fanatically, to make up for lost time. Some of his writing was dreadful at this stage. Quote, like a cow with a musket, a female friend and poet record, quote, Oh dear, how we cruel girls laughed. He truly had to apply himself to master prose form. One of his motivations for going native, as it's often been called, his tramping, begging, etc. in England and France, besides unburdening his conscience, was for the sake of writing material. He spent 18 months in Paris, then the bohemian hotspot for artists and intellectuals, and it was there that he started work on his first novel, Burmese Days, his memories of Asia still fresh in his mind. But his guilt-expiating mania compelled him to experience, and then write on life as a social outcast, in the capitals of his parents' countries. So he went on to publishing these accounts first. Down and Out in Paris and London marked the first of his non-fiction books which combine literary, autobiographical chronicling with social and political commentary, one of Orwell's signature and perhaps lesser known styles. It's in this sort of work, followed by The Road to Wigan Pier and Homage to Catalonia, where he is simultaneously novelist, polemicist and social scientist. You could even say anthropologist. Semi-autobiographical essays in this style, essays like Shooting an Elephant, The Spike, This is How the Poor Die, to name just a few, set Orwell apart as a giant in the history of English letters. Because of his simple, straight-talking prose, you get the impression he's easy to imitate. He's certainly very readable, but don't deceive yourselves. On print is the product of a strong, imaginative mind, with unique powers of observation, and an ability to weave vivid storytelling with unique insights. It wouldn't be an overstatement to suggest his writer's voice is one of the most distinctive in the canon of English prose. This is hardly by accident or just innate talent, but as with all the greats, 
the result of a conscious process of cultivating his style and mastering the English language, leaving us a seemingly infinite bounty of memorable phrases. As an aside, I should state the obvious that Orwell was linguistically gifted. But the inventor of Newspeak and the defender of Anglo-Saxon words was also fluent in French. His mother, Ida, was the daughter of a French father. The young Eric Blair grew up reading and partly speaking French. Jules Verne was one of his favourite childhood authors. Orwell also taught the language during a stint as a middle school teacher, and unknown to many, his first published articles were written in French, published by a Parisian newspaper upon his return from Burma. We're also told that, to the envy and respect of his fellow trainees, he was quick to learn Burmese, Hindustani, and some Karen. His peers were astounded that he could allegedly, quote, converse in high-flown Burmese with local priests. Finally, he had been a classics scholar, and particularly at St. Cyprian's was often top of the class, or not far off, in Latin and ancient Greek. He would spend the rest of his life trying to dissociate himself from what he derided as an overprivileged and useless education, and did not keep them up, famously exhorting readers to ditch pretentious words which sound too Latin or Greek. No doubt to his displeasure though, the influence of classical works and thinkers clearly stayed with him. Returning to Orwell's style, many critics have pointed out that the prose in his non-fiction books and essays is far more vivid and engaging than the prose in his novels. Clergyman's Daughter, for example, which Orwell rated as his worst novel, an experiment only published as he desperately needed some money, bears material from Orwell's own life, as found in the tramping scene near Trafalgar Square, hot picking with vagrants, or Dorothy's stint as a schoolteacher. These same subjects also made their way into Orwell's essays. It's generally agreed that the essays are far more evocative and original than the writing in Clergyman's Daughter. This is because in his essays, Orwell had free reign to explore his own insights and perspectives. In his novels, however, these would have had to be awkwardly refracted through one of his characters, in whom Orwell's voice simply would not work. Social political commentary appears out of place and interrupts the novel's flow, and so the essays are usually richer. When he did project the full range of his voice in some of his characters, it opened him up to criticism. Coming Up For Air was and remains his most acclaimed novel from the 1930s, but a major flaw is that the protagonist, George Fatty Bowling, sometimes just isn't convincing. He seems too ordinary or lowbrow for some of Orwell's lofty register or the sophistication of his reflections. Even so, Orwell's chief preoccupation was to be a novelist, starting out, quote, I wanted to write enormous naturalistic novels with unhappy endings full of detailed descriptions and arresting similes and also full of purple passages in which words were used partly for the sake of their sound. His first four novels from the 1930s, or arguably just three, largely obey those criteria. They were relatively unsuccessful and are not considered his best works. Had he not been an essayist and journalist or gone on to write Animal Farm in 1984, Orwell today would be a literary footnote. Even now, while interesting documents for their place in Orwell's life and artistic development, they are rarely acclaimed. The protagonists, as stated earlier, are ordinary, lacklustre, but ill-starred figures. They all serve as vehicles for social and political criticisms, and as Anthony Pohl noted, were, quote, either projections of himself, or, quote, sometimes effective puppets in expressing his thesis of the moment. His novels fall under the umbrella of social realism, in the footsteps of some of his favourite authors, Flaubert, Zola, Dickens and Dostoevsky. They tell of social and economic forces that hamper or imprison his protagonists, the constant threat of imminent disaster in unfair worlds, the pool of depression and nihilism, with the signature Promethean, quote, unhappy endings that Orwell wanted. It's a testament to his character that he carried on writing when most of his works didn't do particularly well. Real drive patience and a thick skin come to mind. At the same time, it suited his rejection of conventional advancement in all forms, 
Ambitious though he was in secret, he relished the idea of being a failure. Even after Animal Farm had made him famous almost overnight, and had brought him considerable royalties, he wrote that his next novel, 1984, was quote, bound to be a failure. With many of his works, particularly his early novels, he was always somewhat disappointed with the results after completing them, but at the same time, he was always happy to move on to the next piece and improve himself. As after all, literature was his lifelong love. By the mid-1940s, he estimated his library at around 900 books, though we can safely assume that through his personal reading, as well as literary editing and reviewing, thousands had passed through his hands. Literature dictated the nature of many of his jobs, from work in a bookstore, years of book reviewing for various periodicals, to literary editor at Tribune magazine. Book reviewing could be gruelling work. Read Orwell's semi-autobiographical essay, Confessions of a Book Reviewer, for a good laugh. In the essay, Orwell's bolding, nervous wreck of a critic suffers, quote, moral paralysis after opening a parcel of books for review. This finds a direct parallel in Orwell's real life, with one of his colleagues at Tribune finding the gaunt writer, quote, sat eyeing a pile of new books for review like a set of enemies. Ironically, and rather amusingly, he repeatedly fell back on book reviewing for work, whereas he could just as well have been a columnist. We see the same constant attraction of books in his relationship with bookstores. His days working at one in Hampstead, London, drove him to the brink of insanity. The clientele frustrated him beyond belief. Quote, Many of the people who came to us were of the kind who would be a nuisance anywhere, but have special opportunities in a bookshop. But then, even while working there, he told a friend, I wish I had £700, or even £500, and I could start a bookshop of my own. He never did, of course, but it didn't stop him from going around others, trying to set them straight. I'll quote uh, an amusing anecdote from Susan Watson, full-time housekeeper to Orwell and his adopted son in 1945. Quote, On Animal Farm's publication day, George came home and said he had been slogging around the bookshops, moving it from the children's shelves to the adult ones. The booksellers had assumed from the title that it was a children's story. He then gave a copy to my eight-year-old daughter. Friends, remembering after his death, record his wealth of literary knowledge, quote, full of parallels and quotations, that speaking to him about literature, quote, was like a breath of fresh air. His essays and non-fiction work brim with literary references. Read any of Orwell's essays on the writers he admired, his essay on Dickens, those on Rudyard Kipling, Lear, Tolstoy and the Fool, Wells, Hitler in the World State, that's Wells he admired by the way, obviously not Hitler. His passion and breadth of knowledge seep from the lines. And these are also some of his greatest works, where he shows real depth and originality of thought, the result of putting much time aside to scrutinise his heroes. Their passages, in which, to borrow his own words, quote, a writer tells you a great deal about himself while talking about somebody else. Often, the more he admired a great writer, the harsher he was as a critic, applying to them the same levels of scrutiny he applied to himself. Inside the Whale, one of his most famous essays, is an almost book-length three-parter, whose central subject, beyond the meandering political and literary reflections, is review and praise of Henry Miller's controversial indeed in many parts pornographic, Tropic of Cancer. This had a great and lasting influence on him, and in part inspired his last and most acclaimed novel of the 1930s, Coming Up for Air. Rarely was he full of one-sided praise. In fact, that sort was reserved for obscure startup authors or poorly acclaimed ones. Orwell always supported the underdog. Particular scrutiny was reserved for the greats. Literature, above all, was his real love, not politics. Politics, quote, both attracted and repelled him, as Anthony Pohl wrote, whereas books, quote, close to his heart, were, quote, tainted with the opium of ease and escape. Orwell wrote about his political engagement in terms of moral duty, that in any other age, he would have been apolitical, a, quote, 
happy vicar, to quote, preach upon eternal doom and watch my walnuts grow. The statement is supremely questionable, as his personality would likely have made him find political causes or injustices to expose in any other age or context. Cyril Connolly remembered, quote, he reduced everything to politics. In fact, it was an obsession. He could not blow his nose without moralising on conditions in the handkerchief industry. The point is, though, that Orwell himself felt his political work was a deviation from his initial plan of writing literature, his original calling. And so, writing in 1946, with an established reputation as a political commentator, Quote, I am not able and do not want completely to abandon the worldview that I acquired in childhood. It is no use trying to suppress that side of myself. The job is to reconcile my ingrained likes and dislikes with the essentially public, non individual activities that this age forces on all of us. This dualism is found all across his work. The social and political critiques in his fiction the literary passages in his non-fiction, or his writings on the moral and social duties of writers in the intelligentsia. Even his two-year stint at the BBC, broadcasting cultural and literary material to India, Orwell considered it as much a way to satisfy his interests as a patriotic duty. Britain was in a propaganda war with the fascist powers. Fascist Germany and Japan wanted to sever Britain from the empire, demonising Britain and carrying favour with the colonies. Orwell's BBC work was, in effect, soft propaganda for a highbrow Indian elite. Until the publication of Animal Farm, Orwell's books alternated between fiction and non-fiction, satisfying both a love of literature and what he regarded as fulfilling a political duty. Reflecting on his trajectory from the road to Wigan Pier in 1936 to the publication of Animal Farm, during which he embraced socialism and warned about totalitarianism, he said, quote, What I have most wanted to do throughout the past ten years is to make political writing into an art. He had come to understand that if he didn't write something with a, quote, political purpose, then he wrote what he called, quote, lifeless books and was betrayed into purple passages, sentences without meaning, decorative adjectives and humbug generally. Much of the material in his first three fictional books of the 1930s was then not only objectively bad by his standards from a literary standpoint, it also served little utilitarian purpose. Though his political fiction didn't fully satisfy his literary instincts and imagination, he could derive value from the fact that his work could have an impact and involve the telling of much-needed truths. But then his readership for his non-fiction was fairly limited, mainly to British socialists and the intelligentsia. Quote, I write because there is some lie that I want to expose, some fact to which I want to draw attention, and my initial concern is to get a hearing. Homage to Catalonia, he felt, was an extremely important work, and he was disappointed by its relative commercial failure, especially considering the importance of his experience and memoirs, and of course, how close he had come to death. The problem was, his non-fiction wasn't reaching enough people, or the right people, and he had the same problem with his essays and newspaper columns. He realised that to effect political change and reach a mass audience, he needed to change his strategy. Quote, Animal Farm was the first book in which I tried, with full consciousness of what I was doing, to fuse political purpose and artistic purpose into one whole. Apparently it worked out for him. Fighting totalitarianism was paramount, but as he wrote, quote, I could not do the work of writing a book or even a long magazine article if it were not also an aesthetic experience. William Empson, literary critic and a colleague from the BBC, remembers Orwell's reaction to the public reception of Animal Farm in 1945, after a year of rejections. Critics had praised its audacity, its clear-sightedness, its potency as a scathing political satire. But Orwell was solemn. In fact, he was angry. What more do you want, George? It's knocked them all right back. They all say it's terrific. 
He replied gloomily, grudging swine they are. After being pressed by Empson into speaking his mind, he finally said, Not one of them said it's a beautiful book. 